You're watching The Ancient Landmark with Jared Jacobs, first century gospel preaching for the 21st century. Welcome to this another edition of The Ancient Landmark. My name is Jared Jacobs. I'm so thankful to be with you. We might study God's Word once more. I encourage you to get a Bible out and follow along with the things we're going to study. Specifically, we're going to be in the book of Mark. Mark chapter 3, the second book there of the New Testament, uh, second book that records the life of Christ there in the gospel records, the book of Mark. And Mark chapter 3, and we're going to begin reading in just a moment about verse 1 and read down for a few verses and, and notice what I believe to be a very important point and a very important lesson we can learn. We encourage you to get a Bible out and also to feel free to follow along. If you'd like to take notes, whatever you'd like to do, please feel free to do so. Certainly, if you'd like to have a Bible study, we'd love to do that. If you'd like to talk to us and, and perhaps uh, meet together that we might study together, we'd love to do that. We always enjoy opportunities for Bible studies. Uh, if you'd like to have a correspondence course, you can have that as well. If you can contact us. We'd love to send you a Bible correspondence course. And even greater than that, like I said, to sit down face to face and to talk about God's Word, to study that out together. We encourage you to, to contact us through the website uh, at www.southside-churchofchrist.com and uh, you can have access to many other Bible studies and such, but also uh, you can write to us on email from there uh, if you like to and uh, you're in the area, why well, certainly would love to see you with and you could come meet with the Southside Church of Christ here in Owensboro. We'd love for you to come be with us and to spend time and to study God's Word and getting to know you. And uh, certainly uh, encourage you to get a Bible out. Follow along with what we're going to study. We look in the book of Mark chapter 3 and begin reading in verse 1 where it says, And he entered. Now the he of Mark 3 verse 1, the he is Jesus. He, Jesus, entered into the synagogue. The Bible says there was a man there with a withered hand, verse 2, and they watched him, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day, that they might accuse him, verse 3. And he said to the man which had the withered hand, stand forth. Jesus is speaking to the man. He said, stand forth, stand up. He saith to him, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they held their peace. And when he had looked around about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he said to the man, Stretch forth your hand. And he stretched it out, and the hand was restored as whole as the other. And the Pharisees went forth, the Bible says, straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. Now that's reading down to verse 6. Here is just a, a little snippet, you might say, in the life of Christ, a time when Jesus entered in the synagogue and there had a man with a withered hand. He's entered into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And he goes in there, the Bible says, and as he goes, he was teaching the people. Parallel passage to Mark 3 is Luke chapter 6. So if you have a moment, then we do. Let's go over to Luke chapter 6. And we're going to look at, at what, how that uh, version was recorded, or how that account is recorded, Luke chapter 6, beginning in verse 6. It says, It came to pass also on another Sabbath, remember we're talking about a Sabbath day, that he, that's Jesus, entered into the synagogue and taught, and there was a man whose right hand was with him. Now we know specifically what hand it is, the right hand. And the scribes and Pharisees watched him, whether he would heal on the Sabbath day, and that they might find accusation against him. But he, Jesus, but he knew their thoughts and said to the man which had the withered hand, Rise up, stand forth in the midst. And he rose and stood forth. Then Jesus said to them, in other words, those Pharisees, those others around, I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath days to do, e do good or do evil, to save life or to kill it? And looking around upon them all, he said to the man, Stretch forth thy hand. And he did so, and his hand, verse 10, was restored as whole as the other. Verse 6, and then it says, they were filled with madness. And commune, he says, with one another what they might do with Jesus. So again, we see this, that Jesus is coming in. Luke 6, verse 6 says he's going in to teach people. It's on the Sabbath day, and here in the synagogue, he is teaching people. 
They're listening, obviously, and very intent. And here's one man in particular who has, Luke 6, verse 6, a withered right hand. And having that withered right hand, whatever form it took, whatever it was, it was withered. It couldn't, couldn't be used. He, could, he had no function with it. And so, obviously, in a, in a society like that, where you have um, deformity, physical deformities of whatever, maybe a withered hand, maybe someone that's lame, maybe someone that's blind, maybe somebody can't see, I mean, sorry, can't speak, maybe somebody can't speak or can't hear, whatever it is, Jesus would heal these folks. And he makes clear that the purpose of this is so that you know, so that men and women all would know Jesus has power over sin. That they might know that Jesus has the power over sin to forgive sins, he would heal a physical problem, a physical infirmity. And that right there makes uh, things stand out. It, stand, it makes Jesus stand out from the crowd, I promise you. Not only in first century days, but even today. You talk about people who, who have a, believe in so-called faith healing and so-called uh, you know, miraculous healing and what have you where they might listen to someone and that person says, you know, you could go and they could heal someone, what have you. Uh, for what purpose is that? What purpose does that serve other than just to uh, show off, you might say, or other than just to gain a following, other than just to try to dupe people and, and to trick people into following them? What does that do for them? When you look at what Christ did, Jesus says, my purpose in, in doing this is to show folks they have the power, I have the power to forgive sins. Now I want to ask you something. Do men today have the power to forgive sins? Do they have that power? Can they just forgive you of your sin? Can they expunge that guilt and make that all go away? Can a man do that? No, sir. Then how can that same man then turn around and say, well, I'm going to heal you of whatever? It, it, Jesus' purpose was in that. Number two, the second purpose was, second reason you might say, to confirm he was who he said he was. That you might believe. See, John chapter 2 talks about this, and John chapter 3 and 4 and so forth, that you might believe that he is who he says he is. In John chapter 10, Jesus said that. He said, you might not believe me, but you ought to believe the works I'm doing because the works testify that I have come from God. And so... From that, the apostles then could go. The apostles performed miracles. And I agree with, with, with the statement that would say they did not forgive sins. They did not expunge people of sins and what have you. That's true. But when the apostles performed those miracles, they were confirming the word. They're confirming that they're telling the truth. They're confirming that what they're what they speaking has come from God. Again, I ask, what man is going to do that? I mean, we've got the Bible already. We've got the Word of God. We have it in its completed form. What, is, what purpose is served by somebody claiming that they can perform some miracle other than to relieve people of their money or somehow gain a following of some sort? What purpose is served behind that? Absolutely none. Because a man can't do it. But here's Jesus Christ who came and there in his time he has performed these miracles. He gave the apostles power to perform miracles, but those apostles are now dead. And that power of miraculous healing and other miraculous gifts and powers is done away. 1 Corinthians 13 says so. Talks about it there, verses 8 to 10. But the purpose behind it here, you'll see that Jesus was showing that he has the power to forgive sins, He's made that clear from the book of Matthew. He also confirms that he is who he says he is. And in this case, is teaching a lesson to the Pharisees about the fact that, that God's law never was that it was a sin to do good. It was a sin to do good on the Sabbath day. Where they got into trouble was, like you can go back in the book of Exodus and the book of Leviticus and Numbers, and when God had, had told those folks, don't do any work, he didn't exclude them from doing something nice for somebody or doing something helpful for someone, but you're not going to go out and do work. You're not going to go out and, and just go around like the one fella did in the book of Numbers and start picking up sticks out in the yard. You're not going to do that. He was put to death for it, you remember. 
You're not going to go out and do some service work. You're not going to go out and, and do your job and what have you like, like you would on the other days back in those Old Testament days. That's what they're getting at. But to do a good deed, later on Jesus is going to talk to those Pharisees and say, you know, if there was an ox in a ditch we'd, on the Sabbath day, would you get him out? Would that be okay to do if the ox was in the ditch? And then he talks about the fact that how priests are still doing work on the Sabbath day. And, and as they would go, of course, they would see the priests doing their work and the sacrifices and so forth. But you continue to read in the book of Luke chapter 6 and he says, They came to him. Mark 3 and verse 2 says, They watched him. They watched him. Luke chapter 6 tells us who did the watching. It was the Pharisees, of course, and the scribes and others. And they were watching. They watched him. Now I want you to think for a moment about that statement. Matthew, uh, I'm sorry, Mark chapter 3 and verse 2. Mark chapter 3 and verse 2, to me that stands out for a number of reasons. Just go through and, and look at that phrase. They watched him. First of all, it says they. Who is the they? Well, I already told you. Luke chapter 6 and verse 6 says it's the scribes. It is the Pharisees. In other words, these are people known for their position in Jerusalem. This is, these are not nobodies, okay? When you talk about the Pharisees, you're talking about a ruling class of people. Now, I recognize Rome ruled at that time. There's no question about that. But within Jerusalem and within Judea and all of that, the Pharisees had a place. And so they're around Jerusalem, they're around the, the, the temple and so forth, and Jesus would go through, and even some of his travels around. And as he would travel, the Pharisees were following. The scribes were following. These are men that are supposed to know God's Word. The scribes, literally, their responsibility was to write down uh, the things that's been said. In other words, they would take an old scroll, like the Old Testament scroll, they would take an old scroll and they would just rewrite it again. On new, uh, you know, on the new uh, leather, on the new uh, scroll, if you will, going from old to new because the old ones would wear out and you had to have a new one. They didn't have a copy machine, you had scribes. And so they would take those words and, and put them into the new. That's something they did. What we find also is the fact that not only was this going on, but also uh, they were to know God's word. The Pharisees were ones that were uh, had their position and had their position there amongst the Jews as knowing God's Word, as, as being the uh, purveyors of it almost, as being people, they were the go-to men, you might say. They had a position, they had authority. Jesus even said so. Matthew chapter 23, Jesus recognized this. When He told His apostles, He said, Now here's the Pharisees that sit in Moses' seat. All that they say to you, you observe and do. And he said, don't act like them. He said, but they tell you to do something, you observe it and you do it. So even Jesus recognized their position, their authority there at that time. What they tell you to do, you need to do. Now, they were known for that. But they were also known for their hypocrisy. That's something else that we find made very clear. They were known for hypocrisy. Matthew 23, again, if we're in Matthew 23, after Jesus says what they tell you to do, uh, that observe and you do it. But then he goes on and he says this, 23 of Matthew, he says, now, don't act like it. In other words, what they're doing themselves, don't follow in their example. Don't follow after them and do what they're doing. He said, why they bind, uh, they'll bind burdens on people grievous to be born, and they won't even carry it with one of their fingers. They expect more out of other people than they ask of themselves. Now they love to sit in Moses' seat, and they love to have the praises of men, and they love to have everyone, you know, just as, as it will, as it were, kowtowing to them. He says, but they're not leading. They're not being true servants. They're not following what the Lord has said. They're known for their hypocrisy. They're known for their pride and their arrogancy. You remember Jesus speaking about the parable of Luke 18, 9-14. The parable of the Pharisee and the publican and how the, both these men go into the temple and, and the Pharisee stands up and he just says, why? 
Lord, I thank you that I'm not like other men are. Remember that? Why, well, I fast twice, you know, twice in the week, and I give tithes of all that I possess, and I do all these great things. I'm thankful that I'm not like other men, extortioners and murderers and so forth, and even this publican. Now, the publican wouldn't even so much as lift his eyes toward heaven. And he looked and he said in a prayer to God, God be merciful to me, a sinner. The point being, the Pharisee was full of pride, arrogance, haughtiness. He had hypocrisy. Again, Pharisees was known for choosing their traditions over God's commands. You look over in the book of Matthew chapter 15, in verses 8 and 9. In Matthew 15, 8 and 9, and you'll notice here that Jesus was speaking to these Pharisees and over what he said. This people draw nigh to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. He says, you have, have dishonored God, the God of heaven, because you put your traditions above the commands of God. That's what they did. In Mark chapter 7, parallel to this, Mark chapter 7 says, You have made the God's commands of vain. You've made the commandments of none effect or vain through your traditions. Why? Because they accepted their traditions and then they pushed aside God's commands. That's exactly what they did. And that's why they were so caught up with, with uh, you know, washing hands and, and all of that kind of stuff. And Jesus says, You're... you're you're worried about your own traditions. You're not worried about really what God has said. Yes, God was concerned about cleanliness, and yes, there were certain things necessary in washing, but they had taken that completely away from God's intention, and now they were just following their own tradition. That was the problem. Again, we see Pharisees who would try to put one scripture against another. Again, Mark chapter 7 when they talked about how that if you would give your gift to the, to the temple and you could just tell the father and mother, uh, your gift is korban, my gift is korban, and, and that just meant that uh, I gave at the office, basically. I, I gave to the temple and what I should have perhaps helped you with, what I should have done for you, uh, you just need to go to the temple and talk it out with them because I already gave to them and I don't have to give to you. And that wasn't right. So when it says they watched him, when they watched him, the they, these Pharisees, these scribes, I mean, we're talking about some folks who had some real issues, didn't they? Now, I recognize not everyone was like that. Nicodemus, for example, John chapter 3 talks about Nicodemus. Nicodemus, not only, not only there, comes to Jesus, talks to him, wants to hear and learn from Christ. You'll see later on in John chapter 7, Nicodemus again standing up and, and kind of defending Christ almost. And you know, whenever we judge people, we don't judge them without evidence, you know. And uh, trying to put a, put a stop to some of the rantings of the people at that time, the Pharisees. A little bit later on, after Christ's death, it is Nicodemus who is one who begs for the body that he might take that body and give it a proper burial and does so, of course, and takes it and puts it in that borrowed tomb we've talked about before. And so Nicodemus is there. Now, he is chief of the Pharisees, but he's not acting like a lot of those other ones, is he? So there are exceptions to this rule. But the general rule is the Pharisees are haughty, uh, they are prideful, they're hypocritical, they cherry-pick what they want to do, and they take their traditions over uh, God's commands. Think about it. Does that sound familiar? I'm afraid if we looked around today, we might find a lot more Pharisees in this world than what we care to admit. You see, there's where their problems were. Sometimes you, you talk about the Pharisees and people say, people will say this. They'll say, now, a Pharisee uh, was one who he would, uh, <clears throat> how would you say it? They kept this, the letter of the law. They didn't keep the spirit of the law. Have you heard people talk like that about the Pharisees and say, well, they kept the letter of the law, they didn't keep the spirit of the law. And you know nothing could be further from the truth. 
That's not what you find in Scripture. You don't find Jesus saying, you Pharisees, you keep the letter and you don't keep the Spirit. That wasn't their problem. Anytime they were obedient to God's Word, did you know Jesus didn't condemn them? And there were times when they were obedient. There absolutely was. You look over to Matthew chapter 23, and he talks about how you Pharisees, he said you tithe the mint and the anise and the cumin and all that. He said you leave off the weightier matters of the law. And somebody says, that's what I'm talking about. That's their problem. Look over Matthew 23. Somebody says, that's your problem. And that's the Pharisees' problem right there. They, they tie the mint and the anise and the cumin and, and all of that. They omit the weightier problems of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. And so they say, that's their problem. They kept the letter. They didn't keep the spirit. No, 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 no. Keep reading. Read Matthew 23 and verse number 23. Read the whole thing so you quit reading too soon. When you read the whole verse, he says, This you ought to have done and not left the other undone. In other words, what he's saying is you ought to have been doing both. Now the tithing of the mint, the anise, and the cumin and all that's a fine thing to do and all of that, but you ought to also have had the weightier matters of the law in your mind also, the judgment and the mercy and so forth. And he says, you need to have that as well. This you ought to have done and not left the other undone. So it's not a matter of, well, they didn't keep the spirit of the law. What it was, was they picked what they wanted to do and left off things they didn't want to do. When those Pharisees did what they were supposed to do, Jesus never condemned them. Well, he condemned them when they were disobedient. He condemned them in their hypocrisy. He condemned them in their pride and arrogancy. He condemned them in those ways. He condemned them in keeping the traditions of men above the, tr the commands of God. That's where the condemnation was. And that's the people looking at Christ. Mark 3, verse 2. They watched him. I wonder what they were looking for. Think about that. They, the scribes, the Pharisees, they're watching Christ wonder why they watched. Why were they watching? We'll go back to Mark 3 and verse 2. And it just flat tells you why. They watched him, Mark 3 and verse 2, they watched him so that they might accuse him. They might accuse him of something. They're trying to find, let's see what we can find wrong with this Jesus. Let's see what we can find here. That they might, he says, accuse him. They're watching him on the Sabbath day. Let's see if he violates the Sabbath day. Oh, we're going to be looking close now. We're going to figure out what this guy is doing. See, this is not the only time this has happened. This is not the only occasion this has gone on. And where Jesus has acted on the Sabbath day, not saying he worked on the Sabbath day or anything of that nature, but where Jesus had activities on the Sabbath day, and these folks just had a fit. Uh, in this case, Mark 3 and verse 2, when we read Mark chapter 3, the first six verses, we see Jesus did nothing. He told him, up, the man stood up, he told the man, stick your hand out, and he stuck his hand out, and the hand was healed. Now we recognize Jesus has watched the miracle, has, has performed this miracle. We realize Jesus, he has the power and he's performed this miracle. But what activity has taken place physically that you can see? Physically, he's done no activity. He told a man stand up. He told a man stick out your hand. He has done no physical labor. And you'll see these folks, the Pharisees, scream and howl over the fact that he has worked on the Sabbath day. A little bit later, you'll see it also in the book of John chapter 5. John chapter 5, he tells the man that was uh, paralyzed, he tells the man, arise, take up your bed and walk. And so he got up and he had a bed, it wasn't like a four-post bed, it was like a bedroll. We might say like a sleeping bag or something. He just had a little bedroll he laid on and he just took that and he rolled it up and went on his way. Now what did Jesus do? See, he didn't do anything. He told the man, get up. And the man obeyed, of course. He was healed. They were watching him to see how they could accuse him on the Sabbath day. 
ulterior motives. We have talked about earlier on, and I want to remind you of the fact, we talked about the fact that people followed Jesus, multitudes followed Jesus. They followed for different reasons, obviously. A lot of people followed because they wanted to hear, they wanted to do what the Lord said, they were interested in His kingdom, and so forth. But there was another group of people like the Pharisees, and they weren't interested in that at all. They're trying to figure out how can we accuse Him, how can we find fault with Him, how can we trick Him. And that's the purpose of their watching. Think about that. We're going to go and, and have a break here in just a moment. And we're going to come back and continue our study looking at this phrase and looking at this section of Scripture, Mark chapter 3, and I hope you stay tuned with us. That we can continue in this study and learn, learn the truth, learn what Jesus was doing, learn what He is about, and take from that lessons that we can apply to ourselves and that we will be prepared now on earth, prepared for eternity one day. And so you stay tuned, and we'll be back in just a moment. You're watching The Ancient Landmark with Jared Jacobs. Write to us at 2920 New Hartford Road, Owensboro, Kentucky, 42303. Visit our web address at www.southside-churchofchrist.com Our Sunday Bible class is at 9.30 a.m. Sunday worship services are at 10.20 a.m. and at 5 p.m. Wednesday night Bible classes are at 7 p.m. Write to us for a free correspondence course. And a free subscription to the Old Pass, our teaching bulletin. Make sure to tune in to our radio program, What is Written, from 12.30 to 1 p.m. Sunday on 94.7 WBIO. And continue to watch The Ancient Landmark airing daily, Monday at 9 p.m., Tuesdays at 1.30 p.m., Wednesdays at 5 p.m., Thursdays at 11 p.m., and Friday at 9.30 a.m. Our question at this time comes to us from Luke chapter 23 and asking the question from Luke 23 uh, concerning the thief on the cross of the necessity of baptism uh, when, the, when the thief on the cross himself did not need to be baptized. At least that's what the question uh, had to do with. The idea is that uh, do, do we need to be baptized if we can see that the thief on the cross didn't need to be baptized? Well, let's first begin in Luke chapter 23. That's where we're going to read about the thief on the cross. Not only there, but parallel passages. But Luke chapter 23 gives us the most detailed uh, rendering of this account. Luke chapter 23, Jesus has been, by this time, Jesus is nailed to the cross. There are on either side of him, the Bible says, uh, malefactors or uh, their thieves, one version says, uh, which were on the right hand and on the left hand of Jesus. They both at one point, Luke 23, 39, said, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. The other said this, verse 40, Dost thou not fear God, seeing that we are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. He said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Jesus said to him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. That's verse 43. So reading Luke 23, verse 39 through verse 43, 
Somebody says, well, is baptism really necessary? I mean, after all, the thief didn't have to be baptized. Well, the thing of it is, we're assuming quite a bit when we assume, number one, that the thief was not baptized. Uh, I don't believe you could prove one way or another uh, this uh, can conclusively anyways. First of all, understand that thief recognized Jesus. Number two, the thief spoke to Jesus and said to Jesus, I know you've done nothing wrong. Number three, he said, uh, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Those are not the words of a man who is ignorant or unknowing of who Jesus Christ is. Some have suggested perhaps he was a disciple of John at some point that had fallen away. Perhaps he was a follower of Christ for a while, but had fallen away. Remember, there were multitudes and multitudes of people who followed Jesus and John the Baptist at one point. Having been followers, uh, could we not say that it's a possibility he was baptized? I believe you could. You, you have just as much possibility or just as much uh, basis to say that he was baptized as to say he wasn't baptized. In other words, you can't prove either one conclusively, can you? But what I can know is what he said to Jesus. This is not an ignorant man. This is not someone unfamiliar with Jesus or someone just looking to, to ridicule him. He recognized Jesus for who he is and said that he was obviously recognized him as the king of his kingdom. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Recognized Jesus as not being uh, uh, on the cross for uh, actually for a reason. In other words, he was put there unjustly. He said, we are here justly. He's not here justly, it's unjust that he should suffer like he's suffering. And so all that position right there just to show that, that this doesn't prove or negate baptism anyways. What you need to do is go to where the Bible talks about baptism and see what God has said. Matthew 28 and verse 19 he talks there to his disciples, Jesus does, saying there to go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Mark 16, 16, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Acts 2, 38, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sin. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 22, 16, 1 Peter 3, 21, and on and on and on we see this. So when we look at the thief on the cross, we see not a, an example of somebody who is trying to show us that baptism is not necessary. It's a conversation between a penitent man and Jesus Christ the Savior at a point in time before his crucifixion. I mean, rather, before his death, during the crucifixion, before his death. Hebrews 9 tells us that the law or the testament comes into effect after folks are dead, not before. Before Jesus is dead, before his death, Jesus forgave people in a number of ways. Like this man, not only him, we can see other examples where Jesus just pronounced forgiveness on people. He could do that. Anytime after the cross, anytime after the death, burial, and resurrection, people were continually taught to believe on Christ, repent of your sins, and be baptized. That's what I need to do for remission of my sins. And that's what you need to do for the remission of your sins. And let's not hide behind these straw men. Let's take what the Bible says, accept it, live it, and obey it. And we continue in our Bible study together. We're looking in Mark chapter 3 and verse 2, that phrase, they watched him. We looked and noticed that the they was the Pharisees as they were uh, there trying to find something against Christ. There, whenever Jesus had uh, healed the man with the withered right hand, as Luke chapter 6 says. Not only was this the case, but we looked at the word watch. We began looking at that. They watched. Now, people watch for a lot of reasons. Sometimes people watch out of curiosity. Sometimes people watch out of true interest. Sometimes people watch things just to see something they've never seen before. And it is the case in, in here in Mark chapter 3 and verse 2, the Bible says that they were watching him so that they might accuse him. In other words, they had some ulterior motives. They weren't watching for the purpose of learning anything. They weren't watching for the purpose of 
proving him wrong. I always thought that was interesting in Mark 3 and verse 2. They watched him. Not to, not to prove, okay, this man's a fraud. That's not why they watched him. Look at verse 2. They didn't watch him for the purpose of saying, we know his tricks and we're going to show you the little wires and the mirrors and smoke use. He's not really healing anyone. He's not really, uh, you know, uh, changing the life of, uh, lives of people at all. Why, he's tricking you. He's a fraud. He's a fake. He's a phony. No, Mark 3, verse 2, they went and watched him so that they might see if he does something, heals on the Sabbath day, so that they might accuse him. In other words, this, these folks understood Jesus was performing true, actual, real miracles. They understood it. They knew that's what he was doing. There was no question in their minds that perhaps this man is a fraud, perhaps he's tricking folks, he is a charlatan and what have you. No. What they were looking for was a reason why we could get after him and say, well, you shouldn't be performing miracles on the Sabbath day. Well, that's work. And uh, they're somehow trick and somehow uh, find a reason to accuse him, make him look bad in front of everyone. That says a lot, doesn't it? That says a lot not only about the Pharisees, that says something about Jesus too. That says something about the whole situation because they, perhaps today if we knew about folks like this and we, we thought Jesus was walking around, there might be people, people trying to say, well, let's figure out how he's doing the trick. Let's figure out if this is some kind of a parlor trick, some kind of, uh, you know, these folks didn't do that at all. They knew what he was doing was true. And you imagine Jesus standing here today and Jesus standing and whatever physical ailment, whatever physical problem you have, that Jesus could, could speak to you, he could maybe touch the place or whatever it is, but he could heal that. And that problem be gone. You be well and whole once more. In fact, that's what he says, that the one hand became whole just like the other hand. And he could make you whole again. Isn't that amazing? And the thing of it is that what Jesus was doing in the physical was just proving his power over the spiritual. Because Jesus said that the reason he was doing this was to show that he had power on earth to forgive sins. And that's exactly what he had. These people's concern was, is he going to do something on the Sabbath? Jesus will explain in Matthew chapter 12 that, it, that he is the Lord of the Sabbath. And so he knows when he's, he would be violating it or whatever. And he said, we're not violating it. I never have violated it. Never have done anything against the Sabbath. Somehow sin against God or to violate the Sabbath day. He hadn't done it. And he hadn't done it on this day. Whenever he looks to these, this man that has a withered hand, tells him to stand up and then tells him to stick his arm out. Physically, that's all that happened. But you can see in Mark, Mark 3 and verse 5, the anger here. What we're seeing in verse 2, where he says they tried to accuse him, that's going on in their minds. That's not, uh, you know, broadcast to the world. Now, we have it obviously here, written by inspiration by Mark. But that at that moment in time, was not advertised to everyone. No one knows the, all the motives behind why the Pharisees are there, but Jesus knows. And so when he looks around, he looks at them, verse 5, with anger, grieved at the hardness of their hearts. They didn't watch to learn. They didn't watch to, to, to discover. They didn't watch for the purpose of, of, of bettering their life and to have a spiritual life that would be pleasing in the sight of God and prepare themselves for heaven. That's not why they were watching. They were watching to figure out, read, what can we find against him? He's going to do something on the Sabbath day and we're going to catch him. Isn't that something? Isn't it amazing the way the minds of men work? Isn't that amazing to think about how men would do and how people do one another and treat one another so many times? That's what these Pharisees were doing. I want to know something. If you stand in the crowd and you see Jesus and you see him performing these miracles, why are you watching? Why are you interested? 
Whenever you open up your Bible and you begin to read and stay, why are you reading? Why are you staying? Why are you spending time in God's book? Do you want to know what God says? Or are you trying to find some uh, contradiction? Sometimes people read the Bible just to figure out where the contradictions are. And then, of course, they come up disappointed. There are none. But people say that. They'll, they'll look for a contradiction or they'll look and see, well, we're going to find something wrong. We're going to find something false or whatever. There are some folks who spend time in God's Word merely for the academic knowledge. They have no interest in doing what, interest in doing what God says. They just want to say they know something. They just learn something. But that won't help you. We've got to take what is said and then apply it. We need to live. As it were, I need to stand and see Jesus there on that occasion. I need to be watching Him. Not for the purpose of, of saying, you know, I want to figure out what He's doing wrong. I want to find something to accuse. But watch to learn and watch with intent because I want to do what the Lord has done. I want to speak the way the Lord spoke. I want to act the way the Lord acted. That's what it takes. Pharisees didn't want it. Some Pharisees did, but the majority, they didn't want that. The Sadducees, uh, same thing. They weren't interested. Herodians, others of that nature, scribes and what have you, they weren't interested. You look over in the book of John chapter 1, he says in John 1 verse 13, that he came to his own, his own received him not. But as many as did receive him, he gave them the power to become sons of God. He went to his own, his own didn't receive him. Isn't that terrible? That's a tragedy right there. But he says, those who will come, those who will listen to what he has to say, those who will accept it, those who will believe, he give them the power to become the sons of God. You can become a son of God. But why are you watching? Why are you listening? Why are you, why are you interested in this Bible? We want to learn. We want to know what God said. Let's put away all preconceived ideas. Let's put away all our prejudices. Let's put away all of those things. Just jettison that from your life and just with an open mind and an open Bible learn what God has said. As the old saying goes, read it again for the first time. The Pharisees' problem was they wouldn't get rid of their preconceived ideas. They wouldn't get rid of their prejudices. They wouldn't get rid of those notions that they've had. And whenever, here's Jesus Christ coming and he comes as the king of kings and he comes as the Messiah and, but he wasn't in the form they wanted and he wasn't in the way that they wanted to have him and it wasn't in the manner that they wanted and since Jesus didn't fit their criteria they didn't want anything to do with him. And so we're going to find something wrong with him, we're going to accuse him, we're going to trip him up in his words, we're going to trip him up in his actions and we're going to just take him down. How horrible. That's why they were watching. Why am I watching? Yes, my friend, this time that we went to the Bible with renewed vision and looked again. Just read what the Bible says and live it, study it, learn it, and have it a part of you so you, it, it dwells in you. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. So says Colossians 3.16. Let that be the case. These folks washed, didn't they? And it says in Mark 3, verse 2, they washed him. Now, who is the him that we're talking about? Well, it's obvious by now, isn't it? It's obvious through this study. It's obvious. They watched, him. They watched Christ. That's exactly who they were looking at. They were watching Jesus of Nazareth. But I want to ask you something. Who is it that they're watching? When they watched Jesus of Nazareth. Who were we talking about? Well, we're talking about one who was promised by God. That's one thing. You look in your Bibles in the book of John, chapter 1. It's kind of an interesting place to go. John 1 and verse 45 talks about uh, where the Bible says that Philip uh, findeth Nathaniel. That's what it says, John 1 45. Philip findeth Nathaniel. And saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. When, we, when they watched him, they were watching Jesus of Nazareth. They were watching the fulfillment of prophecy. The one who's been promised since Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. The one who's promised numerous times 
through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The one who has been promised in the days of Moses, when Moses in the book of Deuteronomy 8, chapter 18 said, there's going to be one come, to me, come after me, and he says, unto him shall you hearken. He'll be like me, but unto him shall you hearken. He's the one that was promised. This is the one that was promised in the book of Numbers. When in the book of Numbers, Balaam said that I seem, he said, he's yet afar off, but I seem, and he's coming, and here's the, the star, he says, and the scepter. And all of that. That's talking about Christ and His kingship and His, his uh, power and His kingdom that was to come. He is the one that's promised. When they talk about watching Him, can you imagine being there on the scene in the first century and seeing Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph, the one of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, and you get to see Him with your eyes, you get to hear His voice, you get to see His manner, you get to watch Him go from place to place, whatever, you get to see Him heal people, perhaps it is that He would even have been uh, one who would heal you. Perhaps it is He would have touched you and would have healed you. Yes, my friends, they watched Him. They're watching the fulfillment of prophecy. The one that was promised by David when in his prophecy. Uh, the one that was promised uh, there through Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14. And Isaiah 9 and verse 6. And Isaiah 53. And so on and so on. The one who's promised all the way through. Even to the book of Malachi in Malachi chapter 4. And the promise of the Messiah to come. Oh my friend. That's who they were looking at. That's who they were watching. It was Jesus of Nazareth, that fulfillment of prophecy. Jesus of Nazareth, the one who was born of a virgin in Bethlehem. That was promised in Isaiah in chapter 7, verse 14. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Shall call his name Emmanuel. He said he shall save his people from the sins. And there in Matthew chapter 1, you see that that passage, that statement, that phrase was fulfilled that very day. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 22 beginning when he says this was all done. They might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. He says, uh, saying, Behold, a virgin shall conceive. Verse 23, Matthew 1. A virgin shall conceive, bear a son, shall call his name Emmanuel, which is being interpreted God with us. And he says, that's talking about Christ. Yes, my friends, the one who is born of a virgin. In the book of Luke chapter uh, 1, talks about the call of Mary, tell, the angel telling her, Blessed art thou among women, because God has chosen you for this task and for this great work, and she would be the, his mother. And yes, that all came to pass, that came to fruition at that time. It was Jesus of Nazareth, yes, raised in Nazareth. Matthew chapter 2 says so. He was raised in Nazareth. And there raised as the son of a carpenter, Joseph, Though it was not actually his son, it was supposed, he was supposed his son. Luke chapter 3 talks about that. He was supposed in that sense. Uh, the book of John chapter 8, the Pharisees speak there to Jesus and accuse him of that very thing, saying, we were not born of fornication. They're making accusation against the Lord, and Jesus said, I proceeded and came forth from my father. In other words, he knew exactly where he came from. And these little side comments and little snide remarks and things like that, out and out accusations against the Lord, were not so. Here's Jesus Christ. He, he himself coming to this world by the avenue, you might say, of a miracle itself. Not because it was a miraculous birth. The birth was just as normal as anyone else's birth as far as that's concerned. It was miraculous conception. The miraculous conception that took place wherein the Holy Spirit came. Luke chapter 1 talks about there to overwhelm and plant that seed as it were and there Mary would be with child. Yes, my friends. And he, Joseph, the Bible says, Joseph, Matthew chapter 1, Joseph knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son and named him Jesus. He knew her not. In other words, she remained a virgin. Then, uh, and obviously that came to an end. We'll talk about that too because Jesus had brothers and sisters. Absolutely. Matthew 13 talks about it. Jesus had brothers and sisters. John chapter 5 talks about that as well. 
and other places, John 7 and other places like this, discuss the fact that Jesus has, has brothers, he has sisters, there's folks that's married to his sisters and so forth, and all of that. But during that time period, here she was. She had not known a man and did not until after she had brought forth her firstborn son. And so here's the one that they're looking at. They washed him. Yes, Jesus, the Son of God. Yes, the fulfillment of prophecy. Yes, the one that was there, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 9, who lived at Capernaum. He lived there. That was kind of his base of operations, you might say. That's HQ. There, right around the Sea of Galilee. And he lived there. And as you, as you follow the life of Christ through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you'll see him continually making, uh, making a circuit almost from the, there around the Sea of Galilee toward the north end of, of the sea up around Capernaum and so forth and making a circle down he'd go down to Jerusalem etc down far south and he'd come back up and make another circle through and so forth and that was his base of operation that was called his city that's the one they were watching see there's a there's a distinct difference between this Jesus of Nazareth this Jesus the son of God who they're watching and anyone else it's not just the fact you had somebody named Jesus. It, that wasn't it. Jesus was a fairly common name, seeing that Jesus is the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew name Joshua. It's a fairly common name to talk about. And so you had to talk about, in this case, John 1.45, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph, as opposed to any of the others we might uh, have a discussion about. It was Jesus who spoke the Word of God. They watched Him. They watched the one, John 12 says, in verse 49 to 50, talks about how that He was the one who was speaking God's Word. 49 and 50 of John chapter 12. You taking notes? You go ahead and write this down. He says, I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, He said, He gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. For And I know that His commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, even as the Father said to me, so I speak. And so He is speaking, not His words as such, but He is speaking the words of the Father. He said, I am speaking what the Father gave me. He gave me a command what I should say and what I should speak, and that's what I'm teaching. When they watched Him, they watched Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, they watched Him and listened to His words. Those words were not uh, words original with Him, originating with Him, but that which has come from the Father Himself. Those words, John 17, 17, He says are truth. Sanctify them through Thy truth. Thy word is truth. And He says, I am speaking My Father's words. Well, think about this. If Jesus is speaking His Father's words, John 12, 50, those words, John 17, 17, are truth. Therefore, Jesus is speaking what? He's speaking the truth. He speaks His Father's words. His Father's words are truth. Therefore, Jesus is speaking the truth. And that's what He taught. That's what He showed. Over and over and over again. They watched Him. He was the one telling them the truth the whole time. And yet how many people in Christ's day turned away from Him and would rather listen to a lie than listen to the truth? And how many people, that, and I'm sorry to say that's not unique, that's not something just happened then. In the book of 2 Timothy chapter 4, and verses 3 and 4, here we find also the fact that when it came to, to preaching the word, he says there's going to be some, he said, that will turn their ears away from the truth and shall be turned unto fables because they'd rather have their ears tickled. That's my paraphrase. You read 2 Timothy 4, verse 3 and 4, and you read it for yourself, and that's what he talks about. But he said they'd rather have that. They'd rather turn their ears away from the truth. Now, it happened in the days of Christ, and it happened in the days of the apostles. You think it's not going on today? You think it's not going on today? You just need to look around. There's a reason why. You find people who are, uh, they're, they're given to that. They're given to uh, asking, what do you want? Rather than saying, what has God said? 
Look at so many of the so-called mega churches. A lot of their mega churches are, are based on the idea that what do you want? And folks have talked about that. They've taken surveys out in the community. What do you like about a church? What do you like about a church? What's this person like? And so forth. We'll just throw that all together and we'll give it all to you. Christ didn't do that. Christ came preaching the truth. And here when he gives the truth, he says, you can have this. And the truth shall make you free. Nothing else will. Nothing else is going to do. That's who they're watching. And Jesus on that day, when they watched him, he healed on the Sabbath day, yes. He displayed his compassion for this man. He displayed his compassion for others. Not only on this occasion, but on many, many occasions. His love, his concern for people, his, his willingness to forgive sins is made clear, is it not? Now, we need to open our eyes. We need to open our ears and, and see just what's going on. See what's happening. That's what we find. And whenever Jesus comes and they watch him, he heals a man completely. Completely. What can I learn from this? I can learn a lot of things. I think we have learned a lot already, haven't we? I can learn a lot of things. One is, one is this. I shouldn't be like the Pharisees. Don't be suspicious of Christ. Don't be looking for, uh, you know, how we can trip him up or whatever. My friends, that's just a fruitless and a worthless pursuit. Listen to him. The Lord Jesus loves you. Jesus, uh, the God of heaven loves you. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus loves you. And it's made clear all the way through the scriptures. There's no question of the love of Christ and the love of God for his creation. The question is, do you love him or not? That's the question. We need to be like Christ. We need to have right. We need to be compassionate people. We need to have righteous indignation. Righteous indignation just means being mad at the right things. Jesus Christ looked at them with anger. He was angry because of what they'd done. He was angry because of that terrible attitude and that wrong attitude. Now I can't do that. I must. I, I must not have that attitude. The Pharisees. I must have the attitude that says if Christ tells me to do something, I'm going to do it. If, if this is found within Scripture, I'm going to obey it. I'm going to follow it. I'm going to live it. Don't be like those folks who cherry-picked what they wanted and, thought, and tried to find fault and things. I need to completely accept what the Lord has said. That's what needs to happen. And sadly, it doesn't happen with a lot of people. And we see terrible results because of it. Don't do that. I've got to pay attention. I've got to see and I've got to open my eyes spiritually to the truth. You can believe that Jesus is the Son of God and repent of your sins. Confess your faith in Christ and be baptized for the remission of your sins. You can be a Christian. That's not what I made up. That's the plan of salvation that Jesus died to bring into existence. That his blood was shed for the remission of sins and made a way possible that when I accept that plan, I can have forgiveness or remission of sins too. Acts 2.38 says so. Whenever I follow that plan of salvation, see, then I can be a part of his church. Acts 2.47, I can be a part of his church. Not a man's church, Christ's church. And then I can live for Him from day to day. And I can live for Him all of my life. And watching Him, not like the Pharisees watched, but watching Him with the eye of faith to look and see what the Lord has to say. And belong to Him. Living faithfully all days of my life, friends, that's the thing to do. That's the thing we must do. Oh, that we would. What a difference it'd make. I'm so glad that you listened. So glad that you studied with us this time. Hope this has been helpful to you. Look forward to being with you again very soon. Love to study with you. Contact us and let's have that Bible study together and learn God's Word. But until next time, we'll bid you good day. You have been watching The Ancient Landmark with Jared Jacobs. First century gospel preaching for the 21st century. Tune in Monday through Friday for an in-depth study of God's Word.
The Ancient Landmark has been brought to you by Southside Church of Christ.